Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. We're going to get started in just a minute here. Um, a couple of housekeeping things just before we jump in. If you haven't discovered the chat yet, feel free to um, say something in the chat. It's just on the right hand side. Feel free to say hello, drop where you're from if you'd like. Um, we also have an ask a question option. So if Drew and I are kind of talking about anything that piques your interest or if any questions pop in your head about, you know, fan, fan base, community building, anything like that, feel free to also drop your questions in the Q&A and then we will do our best to save time at the end for questions and answer all of your burning questions. But of course, I'll kind of keep my eye on the chat as well um, and just I'll, I'll notice things as, as they're happening and call them out. Um, that being said, uh, I think we'll probably get started. We're four minutes in. I want to respect everyone's time. I know we'll have kind of people trickling in. If anyone misses the beginning part of the webinar, it'll also be recorded. So you'll be able to access it after the fact. Um, and we'll probably share little snippets on social media as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, before we kind of dive into the programming and I introduce our special guest, I just want to take a moment to also talk about IndieFlow to anyone who might not be familiar and introduce myself since you'll also be listening to my voice for the next um, hour or so. Uh, so my name is Tianda from IndieFlow. I'm a recording artist, singer, songwriter, and producer. I've built my online community to over 300,000 people across TikTok and Instagram. Um, and currently working full time just making music and also helping artists build their own fan bases online. Um, if you are not familiar with IndieFlow yet, IndieFlow is basically the tool that I wish I had when I was starting my artist career and didn't know where to start. Um, their whole thing is basically they are a music manager in a software. So everything an indie artist can possibly want or need from project management to templates to social media support to um, royalty collection and distribution, even creating canvases for Spotify, creating promotional materials like EPKs and link trees. All of that stuff lives within IndieFlow on top of there being a human community of other artists, producers, engineers, and music industry professionals who meet uh, multiple times a week to do things like listening sessions, social media sessions, and just career advice in general. So I'm super excited to be working with them, super excited to have you here today. If you're not familiar with IndieFlow, there's a link at the bottom where you can join. Um, there's also an option to join the, the Discord community. So super, super encourage you guys to check it out. Um, hopefully you find a lot of value in this conversation. We hold events all the time. So um, that's my plug for the day. And we'll definitely tell you more about IndieFlow as we go. But um, without further ado, I wanted to also introduce our special guest. And uh, I will definitely let him introduce himself. Um, but just before we do that, I will say a few words about um, Drew DeLeon. So Drew DeLeon is co-founder and chief community officer for a global music and tech community called Digilog. He's also partner and president of an indie music distribution company called NPR Global, recently known for breaking artists like Mooney Long, who recently won a Grammy for best R&B performance. He is formerly the head of digital marketing at Alamo Records and director of digital at Def Jam. With over 13 years of experience in the music industry, he's lead digital for artists such as Rod Wave, Nas, Tayana Taylor, Pusher T, Dana Lay, and Alessia Cara. So no big deal, just a bunch of super, super famous, successful artists. Um, hopefully that shows you guys that we have a lot to learn today. And with that, I will let Drew introduce himself and tell us a bit more about himself. Wow, appreciate the intro. Thanks, Yanda, and also the Indie Flow community. Welcome, good evening. I don't know where everyone is from. I see New Jersey, New York, uh, all different time zones, but welcome. Uh, I'm super grateful to be here. Um, I think a big part of what my purpose is, is to pay it forward and, and help people, especially in the music and, and tech space. Um, as Tiana mentioned, I'm the co-founder and also chief community officer for a music and tech platform called the Digilog. Uh, we focus on various verticals to support the community, uh, one being music careers. So I don't know if you had a chance to check out the Digilog, but we post jobs every Mondays and Thursdays. So if you're a young professional or an intern or looking to pivot into music, definitely tap in. I'll put our socials in the chat. Another vertical that we focus on, uh, very similar to how we support, you know, the community at IndieFlow is just artist discovery, really helping artists, uh, not just from a, you know, support standpoint, but like whether it's through our playlist partnerships with Audio Mac and Tidal, um, being able to like support independent artists that way. And also through editorial content, you know, we want to support you in addition to the music that you release, whether it's through interviews um, and some premium content, very similar to like Colors. So we have a series called On Deck. Uh, we actually actually just released an episode today 
And then education, um, you know, we feel like the landscape is constantly changing. Um, as you know, like today we found out about, um, we'll talk about like different tools, like, you know, like uh, Spotify has a new short form tool called Clips. So it's one of those type of things where like, we, we know the landscape is changing. How do we update you real time as far as like what these tools are? Like for example, a platform or community like IndieFlow, how do you optimize, how do you best use it uh, to best, you know, use it for your rollouts, your marketing and distribution. And then educate, I mean, and the last thing is community, like really tying everything together. And I think for us is being able to be in person, um, hanging out, because I think it's being able to be surrounded by folks that are like-minded, share the same values, and just kind of geek out on just music, things that you love. So we're grateful. We've been doing it for seven years. Uh, we have an audience of over 50,000, but you know, our first event only started with 16 people. And hopefully the goal was to meet people in person and grow this community. But uh, we're excited to continue to collaborate with uh, incredible platforms like IndieFlow. We're going to be at South by Southwest next week on the 14th. So if you're down there, we'd love to see you. Uh, we'll, we'll plug in more details about that. Very cool. And that was a perfect segue into my first question for you. Um, so obviously, we know that you work with a long list of super, super famous, successful artists who have amazing careers. But I'm curious, when you look at the Digilog, how does Digilog provide career resources and artist discovery content for indie artists and rising music professionals who maybe haven't made it that far yet? Yeah, definitely. I think for us, we especially during the pandemic, we saw an opportunity gap within music careers. So for example, within LinkedIn, so if you go on LinkedIn, you're looking for jobs. LinkedIn is like a giant warehouse. So in the, in the US, they have these giant warehouses for shopping called Costco or, you know, and I think what we wanted to do is how do we make it easy for you when you go into this warehouse, you go to an aisle and, you know, us is we're Digilog, we're like aisle 10 and you know exactly what you're going to get. You know, we're going to be the music community where we're going to post internship opportunities, freelance opportunities from all levels and say like, here are the different roles and really help it break it down. Because I think for a lot of the job descriptions, they're, they're very lengthy. So we try to condense and really just, I like to say, create bite-sized information for, for like when you read it, it's easy to quick uh, to consume. And when you digest it, it's like, all right, this is actually a role I can apply for. I think half the job is actually just searching. So each week we're posting 20 jobs for you to at least go through. And I think that's, we're just trying to make the, the process a lot easier. Um, another thing that we, we do is post, um, we have a series called Today's Office, essentially a day in the life of, like for example, in your case, an artist or um, a digital marketer. We really want to give people a glimpse of like what people do each day. And that's one of the things that we do is just really just give firsthand view of, from people that actually work in the industry. Um, and then with the artist discovery opportunities, you know, the reality is, you know, there's so many challenges for, for artists, right, to this day, right? There's 100,000 songs uploaded to DSPs every day, you know, artists are challenged to figure out how to monetize off their creativity, um, how to build community. So for us is like, how do we arm artists with different tools? Um, and I think the first thing is outside of just putting your music out, how do we support and create discovery within your peers? So a lot of our community includes different artists and that also fosters collaboration. So not only are you like marketing music to your core fan base, but as being part of the Digilog, you're marketing to your peers as well. People that actually like listen to music intentionally and support it, but also create opportunities for collaboration. And, you know, I've seen collaborators where, you know, they're obviously not in the same city, but whether it's LA, cities like Vancouver, we have about 25 community reps across the world and we help foster these like local events and um, create opportunities for these different artists to collaborate. And yeah, there's just like all these things that we learned throughout the seven years where we see opportunities to help. And, you know, obviously there's constant challenges for artists. So it gives us a purpose to like figure out how we can like best support you. I think that's beautiful because I think a lot of independent artists, when they first get their career started, they're really focused on, I need to collaborate with this big producer. I need to collaborate with this artist who's already famous. And people forget that you typically come up with your peers. A lot of the successful people we see, it's because they came up with a group of people who are at the same level as them. So I, I love opportunities like that where it connects people, maybe at similar levels or slightly different, and they can kind of build together. 
Um, I'm also curious because you talked a bit about like different roles in the music industry and how they can sometimes be vague or confusing and hard to understand. I think artist manager is like one of the most mysterious jobs and also one of the most inconsistent jobs in terms of like the things you do in a day to day as an artist manager, completely different depending on who you're managing and what day it is and, and what year it is. Um, so I'm curious, number one, what was your experience like as an artist manager? And then how do you think that prepared you for your role now uh, at Digilog? Yeah, um, so just some backstory. So before I pivoted into music, I, I actually worked in finance. So for anyone that is works in a totally different career, pivoting is real and you're able to do it. So I actually pivoted from finance to music and my first role was a music manager. So at the time, um, my first uh, like DJ or like, client um, was actually a close friend and he was like hey you know drew you know how to write emails <laughs> you know how to talk to people um can you can you help me book gigs i'm just like i don't know what that means but does this mean like getting you like jobs for, for your dj and i was like yeah it's like all right you know I'll, I'll try it um and what i did was you know I, I think participating and going out and just really just putting myself out there pitching um you know the, the DJ at the time. And then I think for me, like, even though I didn't have a lack, I had a lack of experience, you know, I created the idea, like I had this management company, I was working, um, you know, to pitch him. And then eventually I got in residency and with that first residency, you know, coupled into like other residencies. And then I really got comfortable. I learned how to read contracts and you, you just learn to do everything right. As a manager, you wear various hats. So you're, you're, you're a marketer, you're, the booking agent, you're the creative, you're the designer. So I learned all these skills. And what what I realized is that even though you you become like an all arounder, you have to focus on something that you do really well. Because at one point, as you scale, you have to like delegate those tasks, right? So in my in my case, I was able to specialize in digital marketing because at the time it was like digital media is very brand new. This is around 2010, you know, 2011. And um, that's where I found like, kind of like my opportunity to help artists the best. But me learning how to like one, help artists produce music videos. Like I could talk to a director and be like, hey, you know, you should block this artist this way, or you know, you should color grade the video this way. Um, I'm not necessarily the expert, but I can speak the language. So that's the benefit of being able to like be well-rounded as a manager. But you realize that as you scale, you want to hire people. And I think the best um, experience is that you know who to hire, you know. A hundred percent. I think that's such a key point. And even like being an artist, it's like a lot of artists come in with the attitude of like, I just want to be the artist. I just want to make the music. But you start to learn as you're in the industry more and more that knowing the language of, of music production or knowing the language of video production or marketing, it helps you communicate with the team members that you have to hire to bring your vision to life. And it's very hard to communicate with people if you don't know the languages they're speaking. So I think in the case of music industry, being a jack of all trades is probably even more helpful in the beginning than being super, super specialized in one thing. And, and also not being afraid to, to know that everything is figure outable, like every single skill. It's just just a matter of like, Kate, dive in, do it, learn quickly, fail forward. I'm sure that probably aligns with your experience. Um, I definitely think you also bet on the right skill in 2011 of digital marketing. I think there's probably not a better bet to, um, to place your efforts in. And on that note, I'm curious, uh, you had an artist who actually won a Grammy in the R&B category for best R&B performance. Um, you were obviously involved in breaking the artist, Mooney Long. So I'm curious, like, what was your experience like working with them? What did that process of breaking them look like? I know that's probably like a whole podcast in and of itself, but if you could kind of walk us through uh, the spark notes or the highlights of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll condense it a bit. But first, first and foremost, shout out to, to Money, aka Priscilla Renee. Um, also, shout out to the team. And I think for, for us, you know, this is about 10 years of experience leading into this moment. Um, you know, when I left digital marketing, the head of digital at Alamo, we really wanted to kind of sh reshape the way that we've marketed artists. And I think for us is really putting the artists at the forefront of not just content creation, but influence, because we saw a lot of just not just labels, distributors, just agencies always kind of depend on other creators to like really push their music. And I think with Priscilla Money, um, she was actually a YouTube creator in 2006. Like she was one of the first YouTube creators, but no one knew that. And, you know, she had like a, a long-term career as a songwriter, um, you know, writing hits for like Rihanna and Chris Brown, but 
you know, in 2021, you know, she decided like, hey, you know, I want to pivot and I want to become a, a full blown artist and, and under the moniker of Money Long. So we partnered up with her under our distribution model, NPR. And the first thing that we saw was like, all right, you, you really don't have a, a community that you you really talk to. You have a lot of followers, but you don't have a talk a community. So what we did was we wanted to foster this community first and kind of identify who they were. So we decided to call them the Money Mafia. And the first thing that we did was empower money to like leverage, obviously, you know, popular tools like TikTok. You know, she's not a TikTok car. She's an artist that knows how to use TikTok. Um, that's the difference. And I think the biggest thing about her was that she was able to be authentic to herself. So whether it's her being funny, her showing the strong songwriting process, her creating kind of like, hey, did you know I wrote this song? You know, type of th these different kind of engagement opportunities with fans. And eventually, when we first started with her, she only had 300 plus followers. And the more content she posted, and this is just the reality of where we're at in terms of like the content landscape, she would post three to four times a day and we would help her do that. It kind of gained engagement. And we found out like what content worked best because in the beginning, there's a lot of trial and experience because you don't know what content connects best with your audience. So as we built this community, um, we're also releasing music. So it's not like, you know, often we see it on TikTok, there's a, like a viral moment and it kind of like fizzles out. Where you're mm -hmm. like, oh, there was this song. It was like very catchy and you just don't think hear about the artist anymore. <laughs> um, our goal was really more sort of create a foundation first. So when we did have a moment, there was a foundation to actually support the variety of it, right? So with hours and hours, I think the timing of it was just, um, I like to say everything aligned. One, it was the holidays. No one was checking for like new music. And I think also where we are, where we're in terms of just like the climate at the time, it was like really dark pandemic. And I think people were looking for like music that felt good. And I think hours and hours definitely resonated with that. You know, we started putting out compilations of different montages of couples and um, showing like, these memories of these different couples. And what happened was, you know, fans would create content around these montages and it just became a thing that was really easy to create. Like, all right, I'm gonna go through my camera roll, create montages of me and my partner or whoever it may be and share that along with the music with hours and hours. And that was like our first, like, you know, kind of trend that we saw and we were able to like really identify it. And the first thing that we did was like, hey, money, you have to like repurpose and post this content and really just engage with your fans because it's one thing to have your fans create the content. It's another thing for an artist to actually acknowledge it, right? So yeah. you want to make sure you're, you're connected and you're like, hey, I want to celebrate this with you because you're celebrating this music with your content. Um, that's what she was able to do. And then in addition to that, as we kind of build momentum, we, we were like, you know, there's this community that really loves her and it's the singing community. So the the next thing that we did was create a karaoke version of the song and we put it up on, on YouTube, created like a duet on, on TikTok and just had the, the singing community, the artist community just like sing. And one of the incentives was that it wasn't just about creating like a contest. We wanted to create a huge incentive. So one of the incentives was for the two, two winners to actually uh, perform for her Valentine's Day show. And, wow. you know, so there was an incentive to, to participate. Not only was that contest leveled up, the two artists were, a, were actually able to perform for, um, for Jimmy Kimmel. So as backup Amazing. singers for money. Yeah, so we created a moment where it wasn't just like, hey, I'm just gonna participate because I like the song. Actually, mm -hmm. there's a real prize. You know, it wasn't just like a small prize. It was like a big prize. And we wanted to create that moment. So that kind of like helped propel, you know, the engagement of the singing community. So that helped with like discovery. And then eventually everyone just, we just kept seeing the song. And what we realized is like, you know, as we built this community six months prior, it wasn't just about the casual listeners anymore. It was about this fan base, the Money Mafia to help really propel it to go forward. So um, that's the biggest difference that we saw versus like, you know, her starting out, imagine hours and hours was the first song she wouldn't have had that foundation. It would probably have been a different scenario. So we're grateful that we had at least eight months to kind of build that before we, you know, had that moment with hours and hours. I'm glad you said that because I think a lot of us discover artists while they're having the moment. And a lot of the times they like delete their old content or they put it on private and you don't necessarily get to see how many videos they had to post before they had that one moment that 
connected. I think the other thing that stood out to me that you said was the way that she would actually acknowledge the super fans and share their content. I think a lot of people get overwhelmed um, because they're like, well, how can I possibly engage with every single person that engages with me as it scales? And one of the best pieces of advice that I was ever given in my career was if you can't make everyone feel special, make one person feel special in public, like show everyone that acknowledgement. And I think like when you look at TikTok, you see artists like Taylor Swift commenting on people's posts and just like picking a few people and really highlighting their appreciation can have as big of an impact as giving people like a little bit of appreciation and spreading that out to everyone. So I think that's that's really cool to hear you kind of like acknowledge that you guys did that in your own way. Um, I'm also curious because I, I'm an artist. I've never worked at a record label. And you obviously have this like behind the scenes look. I, I see everything on the social media side. You've been, you know, behind the scenes at various different labels kind of working on and things that we probably have no idea are even happening. So how has your experience, you know, in the real world and then also behind the scenes at labels, how has that shaped your perspective on like the music industry now and the way that you see it? Yeah, definitely. I think first and foremost is that people don't realize how much data you need to like understand on on the on the label side is because you need to contextualize the information and, and see for example like you know spotify for artists you see a song start to peak and you're like why is this peaking and then you look at the content and you see a song or a video maybe hit 100,000 views and you're like okay maybe there's a correlation here let's let's see if we can like repurpose this content and like share it out let's repost it on as many platforms as we can so data is a big part of what I do each day. And even for me, like, um, I just like to simplify it. You know, you don't have to be a mathematician or a statistician to like really understand it. I think if you understand, uh, I like to say peaks and valleys and just correlation, that's really, really it. It's like understanding where these, where these uh, marketing drivers are coming from. You know, when you look at like your top markets, your top cities, and that gives you really con context as to like the way you market your your music, right? You're not marketing it blindly. You're like, hey, you know, if, for example, in your case, I'm like, let's say your 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 top cities are in Edmonton, New York, UK, um, say Germany, and then there's opportunity here for me. The first thing I think about is like, all right, are there other artists in these markets that are similar to your tier that you're willing to collaborate with because it's just helps expand your reach but also double down in markets that actually are interested in your music um those are the things that are just like the easy things and then you couple that with like okay next time you route a tour let's say at least for north america we're going to do edmonton we're going to do new york city just based off just where your consumption is at coming from both spotify apple and other dsps so data is a big part and i think part of that is being able to tell a story and it helps us really make sound decisions we're not like hey, this is my gut feeling. Like, yeah, trust your gut, but make sure you have some data to support it, you know? That was actually, um, this is kind of a rogue question, but it popped into my head is like, you've been in the music industry for a long time and I have as well. And I think there was a time where we didn't have access to data. Even Spotify for artists didn't exist. So like how much of your decision and label decisions now do you think is based on solely data and numbers and like social proof versus that intuition of like this A&R just thinks this is a really good song or th they just think this person is really talented. Have you noticed a shift in like where the importance and like focus lies? Yeah, I think for at least if I were to wear my A and R hat, it's very different. Um, I think for me, like I like the I like to say there's the ear test and there's the eye test. I think for me, if I were to partner with an artist, is seeing one can this artist write? You know, do they have a strong pen game? Um, not just in terms of collaboration on their by themselves. And I think the other part is like, what is their performance, um, you know, experience like? And if they have that, I think the other things are really teachable whether mm -hmm. it's like being able to create content um, or just being able to like, build a brand. Um, and I think those are the skills that I really look for. Like if you have a really strong pen game, um, I really look for that. So um, we see that with like some of the artist partners, whether it be, I'm sure in your case, um, you know, with Money Long, um, right now with Manny Wells, who's an uh, Afro soul artist I work with and Amari Noel. So they write their music, they are, great on the live set and their content creators so i think those are the things that we check the box and more importantly this is the most important thing they have great character they're nice yeah. people 
It's huge. <laughs> They're great to work with. They're yeah. great to work with. You know, you know, I think people don't understand the artist and team relationship is so important because you're you're in the trenches every day. Like mm -hmm. we have to respect each other. We gotta inspire each other. And I think if you if you can't have that, it's gonna be hard to work and get the best out of each other, you know. That is so huge too, especially as an independent artist, because in the beginning stages in those first few years, a lot of the people that are working for you, your ARs, your managers, they're not getting paid up front a lot of the time. They're getting paid later if and when something takes off. So if you want people to invest in you, number one, you have to be the hardest working person on your team. And number two, you have to be a good person. You have to be, they have to enjoy their interactions with you or else their motivation, since it's not driven by money right away, is completely going to tank and you're probably not going to see those results. I feel like that's a whole nother segue that we could probably go off into. Um, I'm also curious in terms of like building communities and um, managing communities. Like there are so many different things to juggle as you do that, you know, DMs, how many different platforms you post, what types of content do you make? How often are you releasing music, et cetera? How do you go about prioritizing the needs of a community um, once you've built it and ensuring their success? What does that look like? Yeah, definitely. I think for, for me, like, I have to be very mindful because of my bandwidth. You know, one, I'm um, overseeing an organization and running a distribution platform with my partner and the team. So I have to be very mindful, but I'm very big on trying to, like, have quick responses to people that are on LinkedIn. Um, obviously, there's there's some requests that are just, like, out of the scope of what I can do because that's going to require some type of consulting. But I think for me, it's like I direct them towards a digilog first in terms of resources. And then also, you know, other platforms or partners, whether it be like an indie flow um, and saying like, hey, you should check out distribution opportunities here or community platforms like indie flow. So I like to recommend, um, I think if, in regards to careers, um, at the end of each year, I also do like a, a one week office hours. So I just literally have a full week where I just talk to people at least one on one for 30 minutes for the week. But um, I think the biggest thing that I've done was is be able to talk to people in person. Um, it's really hard to do one-on-one -on -one calls just because, like I said, I don't have time. But when I do see you at a community event or a digital event, um, I'm locked in and I'm present, right? And I think that's the biggest thing when I see people like, I'm like, oh, you know, there's Demetrius. Or like, hey, you know, there's uh, there's Thomas, there's Tianda. Like, that's the whole beautiful thing about community. Like, you recognize them. In their names and i think that's the biggest thing i'm working always working on is like is making sure i know the people that have reached out people that um do support me or support the digital log i uh, share their content i uh, repost but um yeah it's, it's it's very challenging to like do the one-on-ones on a daily basis that's the reason the digital log is created we want to make sure they have resources they can just go to um and obviously we also have our patreon as well I think it's so important to have an open ear for feedback, no matter what you're doing in the music industry. Like listening to my followers on social media has helped guide my career so much and, and taking their feedback seriously and just always giving them opportunities to either share, you know, what do you think about my brand? How would you categorize my music? What did you think of the new song? And, you know, sometimes they tell you things even that are maybe hard to hear, but then they lead to your growth. And so I, I definitely, even if it can be like scary, would encourage everyone to, no matter what your community is, whether it's industry professionals or whether it's a small community on Instagram, TikTok, whatever, look for ways to generate feedback from your people so that number one, you can learn from them. And number two, they know that you care and that you're actually tapped in. I get a lot of people messaging me saying, you know, hey, I love following you because you actually respond to people. You actually take the feedback and you actually listen. Um, so I think yeah. it's, it's really cool to hear that that's also transferring into your work at Digilog. Um, on the note of, of music industry and the landscape, I'm curious what you think, again, you've been in the industry for a while, what do you see in the next like five or 10 years in terms of where it, it develops and where things are kind of shifting? Yeah, you know, um, there's a term that we've been kind of coining is that artists are becoming artistpreneurs, right? Entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. essentially the CEOs of their music business, right? And that's what we want to do is like, that's the landscape that I'm seeing where a lot of artists are really taking full ownership in terms of controlling not only where they distribute their music, but like how they, marketing music, really just being more well-educated, well-rounded in understanding, you know, here are the people I want to hire. Um, here are our artist partners. Because it's not just about being creative anymore or just putting your music out. It's figuring out how to monetize and being, you know, sustainable with your career, right? You know, whether you partner with IndieFlow 
and figure out a way to build community, but also figure out all their multiple revenue streams, whether it's through merch, through syncs, uh, brand partnerships, uh, creating uh, subscription models through your Twitch or your Patreon. Um, you know, there's so many ways to build a business. And I always try to educate artists. It's not just through streaming. I think with streaming, you obviously build a catalog, you know, you have a catalog and it, you, hopefully you get a song that does really well and you get those royalty checks, but you know, you want to build other revenue streams and essentially create a business. So I think from an uh, artistpreneurship standpoint, we're seeing more artists understand that uh, versus just like, Hey, you know, I'm just going to put music, I'm going to market it and just rely on streaming to pay the bills. But obviously you have live music, you have all these other things to help support that. And my goal is to really help artists to be able to supplement their living so they can really do this full time. Right. You don't have to be the one percent of like the Taylor Swift's in doing Mass Square Garden, but you could do you can you can go on tours, you can go on European tours and do it in your own way and mm -hmm. be successful. Pay your bills, take care of your family, put your art out and still have money to travel and, you know, enjoy yourself. So I always like to put things in perspective, like do it your own way, manage the way that you can, but you can still build a business that's sustainable, scalable. Um, it takes time, but just, you know, being able to build those tools and mindset. I think, um, obviously there's a lot of creator tools <laughs> right now, as far as like, now we just like uh, Spotify just launched clips. So I think there's going to be a consolidation of, of platforms, mm -hmm. um, only because there's so many. And I think what we've seen in the past, you know, whether it be in my space, there's going to be like a consolidation. Um, I don't know what that looks like yet, but it's going to help. It, there's going to be a consolidation of that as well. So I see that. And there's obviously a lot of conversation around AI right now. So yeah. there's a lot of debate of, off that. But I think with AI, I think, you know, it's just, it's it's really artist to artist. You know, if you feel like the AI tool is helping you with your productivity, then so be it. But I don't really see AI necessarily replacing who artists are because, you know, there's nothing more emotional coming from a human being. So you can't write experiences that yeah. you've never that are robotic or you know or driven from um, an algorithm. So I think that's where there's the cutoff, right? You see, you hear about these articles of like, hey, there's these songs. I'm like, they're yeah, you might have a streaming song from it from an algorithm or, or from an artificial intelligence, but like, mm -hmm. that's not, the whole purpose of music is the human connection. Like that's exactly. what's beautiful about it. Exactly. So, like me personally, um, when I go marketing. to see a show, I'm like, I'm not going to the show to hear you press play on the beat. I'm going to see that human being like sing their heart out and show me that emotion and like feel that connection with them in the room. And so I think there's always going to be a home for like human artists, maybe in collaboration with AI. But I definitely think that's a trend that's coming. That's probably unavoidable. Um, and I also mm -hmm. think like on the note uh, of you talking about artists, preneurs, I think embracing all of these new things is really key, right? When you look at evolution, it's always the species that are most adaptable that succeed. I think in the music business, it's the same way. It's the artists who remain enthusiastic about all of the changes and the people who are early adopters and jump on first. You know, some of the TikTok artists or TikTokers even that blew up in the beginning of TikTok, they weren't necessarily the most talented. They just got there first and they worked hard on it before anyone else kind of caught on. And so I think like, even if you don't like the changes at first, it's really important to remain enthusiastic and try to jump in head first when you can. And also recognize that you can't do everything all on your own. So not being too hard on yourself if you're not um, easily adapting right away. But right. I, I super appreciate that um, that note, especially about AI, because I think that's like a fear that a lot of people have. Um, I think one thing that AI is going to struggle with in the future is building communities because, you know, we've seen a couple of AI kind of influencer artists exist. You know, Lil Michaela, for example, mm -hmm. is a pretty big one. She has a few million followers. Right. But um, I do think that human beings, just because we are human, we have that connection, we have an advantage in terms of our opportunity to build community. How important right. do you think it is these days to build a community in order to have a successful artist career as opposed to, say, like 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's crazy to say, but community is such a buzzword now, like community is yeah. currency. Um, it's so important, but I think also understanding what the commitment of building community looks like, right? Because everyone can be like, oh, I want to build a community, but you have to think and really be disciplined about it. You know, it means, okay, what can I manage within the scope of 
my fan base, right? So let's say, for example, you know, you're an artist, you have 500 followers on Instagram, or, you know, at least a hundred of those followers into like my super fans. And what do I do to like create fandom um, and create uh, opportunity to funnel that fandom? You know, um, so you, for example, let's say you create a group me or uh, a group chat of where you create this group chat for these hundred fans. And then on a weekly basis, you check in, you drop, you know, your, your, your daily or your weekly like check in or like what's everyone up to. And then you work with them to be like, Hey, I don't want you just to be fans. I want you to actually be contributors to like my creativity. So I think mm-hmm. that's really the biggest difference where we're seeing with uh, followers and fans uh, is where fans actually contribute to like your creative process, right? Give you feedback on tracks, you know, actually maybe even like if there's like a graphic designer who's a fan base, maybe who's who's willing to like help you design your artwork or stuff like that. So you start to build these things, but I think the biggest thing is that you're consistent with it because it's it's really difficult to just create a discord and not actually like be active in it right yeah. you're just like oh i have all these people here <laughs> but there's just like idle so yeah um you know so you can start really small you know it could be like a group me or it could be a newsletter um just be consistent because even with a newsletter you know if you're going to be creating one you have to put something out at least at, at the minimum twice a week I'm oh, no, sorry, twice, uh, every, every two weeks. So you just want to be top of mind and be like, all right, here's some quick updates. You don't have to read the full thing. Um, but this is what I'm working on. Is, you know, here's like an unreleased song. Here's an unreleased video. Just give them updates on what's going on. And then they also know how to support you for your future releases and so forth. So, um, yeah, you got to be really consistent. I think um, people say like, oh, how did you build the digital log? I was like, we're seven years in. Yeah. And uh, we didn't think about it like, hey, you know, our first event only had 15 people. Our goals wasn't like, hey, we've got to get to a thousand, hundred thousand. We're like, we're going to do it person by person. We're going to like get to know the people. Because I think what's, we're, 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 we're always hyped like, oh, we got to get as many people as possible. I'm like, no. Yeah. You know, community is really has to be intentional. Like, you really have to make sure the people that you're following, the fans, like, it's not just about the numbers. You just, you know, because you can have a hundred diehard fans, and that could do a lot. You, mm-hmm. you just, you're you're dedicated and locked in, so it's less about the numbers, but more so the intention that you're you're focused on when building community. So that's my biggest take, because people want to like I've seen people rush and like, oh, I want to get hundred thousand subscribers this time the third, but like take your time, you know, you know, be able to like have scale or, or the team to support it. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen artists make as like someone who's helped artists grow their online fan bases. I helped artists last year get over 50 million views across Instagram and TikTok. And when artists would talk about community building, they would always focus on how do I build the biggest community possible? And so they post a lot of what I would consider to be outreach content, which is videos and pictures that are optimized to meet as many new people and pull them in as possible. And they forget to post content called nurture content, which is the content that deepens the relationship between you and the fans that you already have so that they feel like that value that you promised them the first time they they found you, they're actually getting that in your community and they have a reason to come back and search you out. Um, On on top of that, I'm curious what you've seen in the industry as like the biggest challenges that artists run into when trying to build community. Yeah, I think that the biggest thing is time management, right? Yeah. Um, So as an artist, as a creative, you have a laundry list of things to do each day, right? And it's not necessarily the same each day, but I think first things first is prioritizing the music. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at it is you may necessarily respond to your fans as, let's say, as an artist that day, but I would advise to give yourself a day where you can respond to your fans within, you know, uh, I like to say within like 72 hours. So it's like, all right, if Wednesday is the middle of the week, I'm going to respond to my fans for at least a two hour period. I'm gonna give them, I'm gonna like everything, this and the third. So this way you're not distracted while you're being creative because as artists and just creatives in general, like our attention spans are always hijacked every day because the notifications, there's always something going on Twitter or, you know, I'm getting post notifications on all these different platforms. I'm like, all right, so how about just to be creative and locked in, put on everything on Do Not Disturb, 
focus on your stuff. And on Wednesdays, I'm going to have all these notifications. I know it's going to be a lot, but I'm going to go through it and I'm going to be locked in and focused. So you're not just like spreading your attention in like 10 different platforms or just 10 different tasks. So that would probably be yeah. my biggest advice is giving yourself dedicated time just to help with your, your time management. Um, as you scale, you're going to be, you hopefully you have an opportunity to like hire someone, whether it could be a community manager or like a fan engagement person to help really respond. Um, in that case, you know, that's when you have a team to really manage the communication with your fans. And obviously you're going to, ma- you're going to like manage most of the communication, but, um, you'll have a team to help you do that. That's huge. I think a lot of people, you know, in the world of like switching between five different social apps and trying to make music and trying to film content, we forget that it takes on average 26 minutes to recover from a distraction. So if you're in that flow state and you're writing a song and you check Instagram and you reply to a message, even if you get back to work right away, it's going to take you 26 minutes on average to get back to that point of focus that you had before you got distracted. So especially for artists who have like day jobs or other priorities, blocking time off, being like, okay, Monday is my content day. All I have to do is shoot content. Tuesday, I'm only writing music. I'm not checking my phone. That was really what helped me for you know all the years I had to work a job at the same time as trying to build my career and manage that. If I didn't time block and I let myself kind of chase everything at once, I don't think I would have been able to survive and also maintain my sanity. So I'm glad that you called that out because I think that's like, that's so key. Um, I'm also curious, like, if you have any specific tools or um, apps or anything that you've seen has, has been really successful in helping artists build and engage their communities consistently. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the it's, it is old school direct communication, obviously MailChimp. Um, you know, you can obviously collect emails through uh, some type of pre-save or like at your shows, you know, the people RSVP. Um, I think newsletters are great because you can literally build a newsletter and schedule it. And it won't take you very that long, probably most an hour. And I think part of that is just, it's it's a community that you have direct relationship. People are checking their emails. Um, and I think you get to know from a demographic standpoint where those emails are from, you know, who's opening those emails. Um, so the, a lot of the data, so I love MailChimp. Um, we use that, you know, for the Digilog. Um, I mentioned obviously Discord. Um, I think Discord is like, it's a, it's a premium platform. So there's levels to it. So mm-hmm. I always like to say, um, if you have the bandwidth, if you are very active, um, and then there's other communities on, on just social platforms, I think being able to, you know, optimize like conversations on like Twitter spaces on Twitter, you know, being able, there's like groups that you can create. Um, obviously, you know, even still popular, um, you know, Facebook groups, uh, it just really depends on like where your, your audience is. Um, I think the most important thing is being able to like be consistent when talking to them. Um, you know, for me in particular, you know, for my own personal brand, you know, my community is on LinkedIn. Um, that's where I'm most active um, versus like when a digilog or like, you know, is, is mostly on Instagram. So it just really depends on like where you feel like you can have the most direct communication with your, your audience. Someone actually uh, commented on your LinkedIn in the Q and A, and they said they love your daily inspirational posts. Um, <laughs> so we'll we'll get into the question that they had later, but obviously, um, people are recognizing your efforts there, so that's Appreciate amazing. Um, I, I also think it's important for artists to remember that, like, if you're starting from nothing, if you you have like less than a thousand followers, let's say, um, some advice that I got really early in my career was you don't have to spin all five plates at once. You can get one plate spinning really well, and then you can start spinning other plates. Otherwise, you just end up doing like a, an okay job on each app versus like really super serving those fans. So when I started, it was all about Instagram, and I didn't add TikTok until a year and a half later. And then a year and a half later, I added Discord. And because of that, those communities are really strong. You know, I made a decision that Twitter, it's not the most important platform for me. And that's okay, I can add that later, rather than overwhelming myself, because learning content and learning your, your kind of the way you express yourself in that space is it's a whole task in and of itself. And um, also remembering that, let's say, if you do build up an Instagram first and nothing else, you can still take all of that content down later and post it on the other apps. It doesn't mean that you're disqualifying yourself from those apps. And it doesn't mean that you're wasting the content by just siloing it in one place. It just means that you're recognizing that you don't have unlimited capacity and you're doing the best you can with what you have and you can expand that kind of later. Um, so I'm glad that you brought that up. 
I'm wondering, oh, go ahead. No, no, I, I agree. You know, I was just saying, uh, I love that strategy because artists like, you know, how many platforms could I post? And I'm like, well, I always like believe in the rule of three. So if yep. you start with three that you can manage and maybe one that you really prioritize, then I think you can start there. So if Instagram in, in your case, was that it? So you really focus on that. And then you can repurpose a lot of that content in your case, whether it be TikTok or Discord. Um, but yeah, things take time. And I always like to say, give yourself grace in this process because you're not going to be able to like just get these big numbers in the beginning. Like I said, managing your expectations, mm -hmm. not just trying to grow a community for the sake of just this, you know, this huge number, but being like, hey, you know, um, I might have 5,000 um, followers in comparison to like my peers who have more, but these followers, but more so fans are really super engaged. And I, the engagement is very different from those that have huge, you know, bigger following. So I'd rather 100%. focus on that. Yeah. And there, there are websites um, like TikTok view count, for example, that will show you like, okay, this is how many views you have. This is how many likes you have, but here's your engagement rate, which to me is the most important um, number. Uh, we've talked a lot about building fans and reaching out to strangers and growing a community. I'm wondering how important is networking with other artists and industry professionals in terms of building that community? Is that a huge part of it that you've seen? Is that maybe unnecessary or what does that look like in the current landscape? I think it's so important and it's huge. I mean, given that what we went through with the pandemic, um, it was beautiful the fact that a lot of creatives were able to connect online. You know, at, some, at one point we were on Clubhouse. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember that era. <laughs> if you don't remember Clubhouse, drop a one. <laughs> uh, uh, there's Twitch, right? So there's all these different um, virtual like platforms, but there's nothing beats like being in the space where like you're in the room with that person. And I think what, the beautiful thing I see is like being able to help creatives um, really improve their soft skills, being able to talk about themselves um, and really geek out. I'm like, all right, hey you know i've been cooking up these beats i want to share with you and you get to talk about just the production um the chord progressions the melodies you create the instrumentation like like nothing beats talking about things that you love with other people that love what you do <laughs> so, yeah. and that energy that energy is re irreplaceable you can't quantify it it's you know if you've ever been in a room with other creatives and drop you know drop a one if you agree um it's so special and that's why we love our meetups, we love our events, because it helps um, really just re-energize the energy when you're low. Because as a creative, you're always in your own bubble, whether it's a small group, yourself, just creating, you know, music, content. That can be a taxing journey. So when you're in a room with other creatives, other young professionals, they're like, I'm not in it by myself. I got mm -hmm. this crew, we can like share our challenges and we're in the trenches together so that's the way i see it it's amazing too like the things you learn by accident by just surrounding yourself with people who are like smarter more creative more talented than you mm -hmm. or even just as talented as, as you like i've had some conversations in passing with creatives that completely changed the trajectory of my career because they just said like that one thing that i didn't know that i needed to hear or they gave me that one idea that i just kind of ran with I think another thing that's really important for artists to remember as they get online and they start trying to network with other artists, industry professionals, is there's a right way to do it that works and there's a, a way that turns people off or, or doesn't work. Um, one of my best practices for networking is it should always be about what you can give. You should never be sliding into someone's DMs with a request of them or an ask the very first time you speak to them. It should never be, you know, hey, listen to my song. Hey, check out my page. Hey, will you follow me? Hey, will you share this? Even if you think that showing them your, your music is a favor or a privilege, you have to remember that you're asking for their time and attention, which is like the most valuable thing you can ask for them. Um, is there anything that you would add there in terms of like a best practice for networking online with professionals and other artists yeah definitely i think as an artist um if you're just sending music without context you know that's to me is unprofessional only because mm -hmm. just think about meeting a, a stranger <laughs> and you're just like hey buy this you, you you haven't established anything so i get a lot of that and i'm like um you know just really give them some best practice like hey you know this is not the best way to like go about this mm -hmm. um and i think that's one thing i think one of the icebreakers that i really like I open conversations on is like if you're a digital community member and you actually are engaged with the things that we're doing, I'm going to respond because you're you're actively doing 
the things for yourself before actually I can help you with, right? It's like, all right, cool. Like I'm actually submitting music to the playlist. I'm engaged with these things because you're proactive. It's not just about, hey, I know this person that is really has this experience and I'm going to just skip steps. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's important. I think also being intentional is like who you communicate with and doing some research, right? So if you listen to a podcast, if you saw a recent show, like there has to be some context. So like there's like some familiarity where like, all right, this person did the research or like is really intentional. Like they're not just like, this is a 10th person I'm reaching out to in, the, in this hour. Right. And I see that yeah. sometimes it's like copy paste. Like, yes. <laughs> and uh, to me, that's not, I don't think you get the best results that way. I completely agree. And like, I, I wouldn't consider myself to be like a huge artist by any means, but even, you know, with an account my size, I get a lot of requests, especially from um, up and coming producers and beat makers who are trying to place instrumentals with me or get me to write to their music. And, you know, some, some producers will go out of their way to be like, Hey, you know, I made these beats with you in mind, or I put together my, my top five beats that I think match the sound of the songs you have on Spotify. Like, here's the link if you'd like to check them out. Whereas some producers will be like, Hey, can I send beats? And then they'll be like, by the way, do you write songs? And I'm like, did you did you look at my page at all before you sent these? Or am I just like number, you know, 500 on your list of people that you kind of blasted with this information today? And it's really not that hard to stand out as like a thoughtful person that I want to collaborate with if you just take that extra step to make your message a bit more intentional. And it sounds like you've kind of had that experience as well. Um, how is everyone doing? I have a, one or two more questions for Drew, and then we're going to jump into your questions. Uh, everyone drop a, a one if you're still alive, if you're enjoying yourself. If you like Drew's beanie, drop a two. I think I'm a two. I think I would like to upgrade to an orange one. <laughs> one and alive. Okay, amazing. Beautiful. Um, I'm learning a lot from this conversation, so hopefully you can. As, as am I. As am I. <laughs> as am I. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, obviously, we've talked a lot about the, the ownership of marketing and community building on the artist side and how much work that the artist has to do in order to do that. But there's obviously a role that labels and especially major labels play in also marketing, traditional marketing, commercials, mm -hmm. ads, radio, interviews, mm -hmm. press, etc. How do you think those two things work together? Is there one that you think is more important than the other? What would you say your take on that is? Yeah, I think there's, there's a time for it, mm -hmm. right? I think depending on where you are as a level of an artist, so if you're an artist and you're like, hey, I want to be a global artist, right? You're going to graduate. I want to um, 50, 50 million monthly listeners. Like I wanted to, I want to be a global artist. Okay, great. So you're going to partner up with a label um, who, whose really best job and skill sets is really to amplify, right? Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily the best at developing, um, but they do what they, when it comes to just like amplifying the big artists, right? They, they know how to put artists on billboards. They know how to like do international press runs. Um, that's what they're really great at. And I think it just depends on like where you're at. I think when you're more of the mid tier developing, um, understanding like, you know, there's levels to it, right? So if I'm going to go with the publicist, you're not going to necessarily try to aim for those big looks. You want to get some more of like editorial opportunities that kind of match where you're at because you know, it's hard to get like a, a a complex cover or a billboard cover when you don't have traction. Um, and I always like to say, build that up because there's actually a real story there when you, before you even get to that point. Um, and then we saw that even with like money, like it wasn't like, hey, let's just get the big looks first. Like, let's make sure we're we're checking all the boxes because she's a brand new artist. We're not going to just skip steps when it comes to these highbrow opportunities. Like, we want to make sure we cover all the platforms, developing platforms, to make sure like she's still a developing artist, even with the variety of her music. And I think that's something to recognize um, once you start to partner up with a label or, you know, these bigger, you know, media platforms. I totally agree. And I think even before the stage of getting a label, you've been getting a manager, being real with yourself as an artist about what level you're at is so important in ensuring that you're not wasting your time on things that are maybe out of your reach at that current stage in your career. I think one of the biggest mistakes I made when I was like brand new making my first songs is I wasted a lot of time chasing opportunities that I saw other artists getting like big playlists or writing grants or applying for like 
big slots at festivals when in reality, like my music wasn't even good yet. And I should have been taking all of that time into making really good music first and making sure that I was competitive before putting all that time into learning things like grant writing and playlist pitching when I quite frankly didn't have a chance. And one of the things I love about the Indie Flow community is because we have weekly sessions where we review your music and we listen to it in a group and we give you feedback about the production and the mix and the writing and we review your social media and we'll you know essentially roast your content and tell you what you're doing well and how your brand is coming across online. Um, everyone's obviously very respectful and professional, but it kind of gives you that that check in to realize like okay, like maybe the song is really good, but the mix isn't good enough to even qualify for playlists yet. So I need to focus my time here instead of trying to learn like what is the best way to pitch to all of these things. So I would say like if you're an artist out there who doesn't have people in their life, you know, maybe you only have like your mom to show your songs to and your mom just thinks that every song you make is amazing. Um, maybe there's an opportunity in your life for more people in the industry who can give you that unbiased feedback who are looking out from like a an industry standard perspective instead of a, oh, this is my sweet child. I love everything you create perspective, which is helpful definitely for confidence, but maybe not necessarily for your development. So um, again, check out IndieFlow if you haven't. I, I definitely wish that I would have had that reality check. It would have saved me a couple of years but um, better late than never. Um, before we get into the audience Q&A um, and answer some of the questions we have there, is there one piece of advice, if, if people only take away one thing about community building, what would that one thing be that you would give them as that piece of advice? Yeah, I think the just being patient in the process. Um, you know, communities are not built overnight. Um, like I said before, seven years in, um, in your case, I'm sure, you know, building your Instagram community, your TikTok community. And yes, patience is tough when we're like living in this on-demand mm -hmm. economy. Like tomorrow, Amazon Prime, cool, got it. <laughs> but community doesn't act like that, right? You know, and I think being intentional, like, all right, um, if I have 25 people that are part of my Discord, how do I create the best experience for those 25 people? And then the more people that come, how do I can additionally like create even more intimate experience with them. And and I think just taking your time in this whole process of building, like I said, seven years, um, I like to say we're in a great space because we're not rushing it. Um, we're doing workshops like this. Um, we're doing events, you know, with, with Indie Flow next, next week, but let's, that didn't necessarily happen overnight. And I think to my point earlier, be patient in the process. And, um, you know, that's my biggest takeaway. I love that. I would I would echo um, what you said. I think people um, see this journey of like viral song and they think it's like a one way, like lateral kind of move. And it's often like this. It's often sideways and backwards and up and down. And um, you also have no idea how long it's going to take. So don't uh, try to estimate like, oh, in, in five years, I'm going to be here. In two years, I'm going to be here. It could take two months. You never know what song you're going to write. So just keep pushing forward without worrying too much about like how long or when. Um, I love the questions we have in the Q&A. The top one right now is, do you have any book recommendations besides oh, yeah. the book called All You Need to Know About the Music Business? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to pull, pull a book from my thing. Oh, I got this book called The Song Machine. So it's just like around like how hit songs are are made. But um, definitely check this, this book out. Um, and yeah, John T. Brooks. So I actually work with songwriters. So it was one of the reasons why I, I read it. Um, but as far as like outside of music books, I do like reading books just to like, just for self-improvement. Um, this is a popular book. I don't know if people have read it so far. Um, you know, I, I like Atomic Habits, which is a really good mm -hmm. book in terms of just like building good habits because it, for me, the way I see it in the music business, yes, is it is the music business. But I also, I also always look at it as more the people business. And you just happen to, to, the medium is music. And I think you develop skill sets where you know how to like talk to people, manage relationships, um, be able to take care of people, be nice and kind. Those are the things I, I see the, the people that are doing really well at and propelling at because they know how to really talk to people and take care of people. The music stuff, you can learn. Mm -hmm. um, all these other things, or things that you should practice. Absolutely, I love that. I think it's a great choice. I've read Atomic Habits, it changed my life. Um, I'm gonna plug a book too, because it's right here. This is my favorite book. You guys have oh, read Russ. it? Oh, Russ, yeah, I read that, yeah. Got the Russ hat, got the Russ book. 
Um, Russ released 11 albums before he got any industry traction. So if you want a lesson in patience, that's a really good book to, to read. Definitely highly recommend. He needs to pay me for how often I promote it, I swear. Um, love that Russ book. Yeah, a lot of people have read it. It's a pretty quick read. It takes like an hour and a half if you do the audiobook, And uh, it's just like a life-changing book in terms of advice. Um, another question we have that is at the top here is what would you recommend for someone who's trying to build a fan base starting from absolutely nothing and they have no help? Yeah, Let's assume think, too that they have no money. Let's assume they're doing it for free, just for like extra spice. For, for sure. And like, there's a lot of free tools, honestly. Um, as as like an artist, it's like being able to, like I said, dedicate time towards it, right? Mm -hmm. So outside of your 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 creative process, your everything that you do, the laundry list of things you do. So if you dedicate that time on a Wednesday to really respond and cultivate, I mean, the smallest thing you can really do is like, I, I love creating just like group chats because it's easy. Um, you can literally create one um, on on your Instagram and, you know, Instagram just launched a new platform called Broadcast um, where you can really get more of like your followers to kind of chime into your content. Um, so just a heads up on that. But that's something easy that you can do, zero cost uh, newsletters. I mean, obviously there's gonna be um, a certain level of subscribers where you do have to start to pay, but there's different platforms outside of MailChimp that you can use, but start small. And I think once you get to a space where like you're consistent and you see like a consistent group of people tune in, you know, every week, and then you figure out how to like, you know, migrate the, that community. Um, so it just all depends on like how consistent you are and like, you know, being patient in, in the growth process. Yeah, I I agree. And I think like piggybacking on on what you said, if you don't even have enough followers for an email list yet, or if you don't even have enough people following you for a group chat, then your first step is really like grab your cell phone and get on the internet, right? And when I look at people who are building from zero, the best thing I recommend is post five videos a week. Just do it. Don't think too hard about making them perfect, looking perfect. If you don't know where to start, find an artist that you can copy and just start getting in the habit of creating and figuring out what feels good and what doesn't feel good. And, you know, you'll figure out after doing that for a few weeks what is going to get traction and what isn't. But, it, you know, in, in today's day and age, like if you can just use your cell phone and show up online every day, that's going to do so much for you in the long run. So if you're starting for free and you really have nothing, no support, just doing that much will put you, you know, way ahead of, of people who aren't aren't willing to show up online. For sure, for sure, and it could be something as simple as, um, you know, artists that you're you're fans of, and literally creating like a list. All right, so every Monday I'm gonna create a list of my favorite artists that I want to collaborate with. Like, if you, the thing is, like, if you're just consistent with it, um, the the traction will build as you start to see people to support it or, or follow it, whatever it may be. And I think that's the biggest thing to your point. You know, those are free things. It's just being able to be consistent about it. Um, like, for example, on LinkedIn, like one of the audience members, like, you know, I post a quote, you know, every day. But, you know, I think about it like, you know, that's something that I want to do to like put positivity in the world. But in my mind, I was like, in order for this to like really, you know, impact people, I need to do this every day. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, I set up a schedule like, it, it, you know, it's scheduled for 10 a.m. every day. So that's what I do. So it's just being consistent about it. And that's huge too, because when you're showing up on LinkedIn and you're sharing that inspiration, you're not saying, hey guys, look at this thing I made, listen to the song I made. You're saying, hey, here's something for you. Here's what I'm giving the community today. And that's really how you for build sure. and how you get people to see your value. We have a couple of questions about Digilog. Um, number one is how do you submit for the Digilog playlist in consideration? And number two is, is Digilog hiring? Yeah, so first question, I'm um, putting the email in the chat. So um, you can submit to artist discovery at the digilog.com. Um, flag that you were a part of this indie flow industry session. And, you know, I get that email as well. So I'll flag it with the team. And then we actually have different editorial playlists. So one play, you know, one thing that we do every week is our version of like New Music Friday is called What's New New. So if you have new music dropping this week, uh, we'll feature you. Uh, we have uh, five editorial playlists. So we partnered up with, like I said, Audio American Title. Uh, we have a playlist called Channel Purple, R&B, um, Rapper's Delight, Hip Hop, uh, international playlist called Global Goodies, and kind of pop indie alternative um, and dance called Pop Hype. Um, and then we also have a college playlist called Campus Collections. So if you're in school, you're at uni, 
Um, definitely submit for that. Uh, most recently, we launched a series called On Deck. Uh, essentially, it's our kind of emerging content platform where we shoot and film and artists perform live. So it's a live audio version. So uh, that's kind of our premium content. And then, yeah, reach out to our discovery team. We'll probably respond within the first, you know, 36 hours. Uh, we do get a lot of submissions, but um, our biggest thing is making sure we support 99% um, of the artists that, that, that submit with us. And um, yeah, excited to hear new music. On the note of hiring, do you think that uh, in order to get an internship in the music industry, you need to be in school? Do you think schooling now is necessary? No. Um, and, I, and I only say that because I know some incredible people that didn't necessarily, didn't necessarily finish uni and are working in the industry. I think it's more so how involved you want to be in the music community, um, how passionate you are in the space. Because I see people that outwork um, and really just outlearn people that have gone to school. Um, but I think once you're in, like every, it's an even playing field, right? It's really up to you to decide like how, you know, where you want to go, um, where you want to be, um, or if you want to just be in a position where you're at. Um, and like I said before, you, you don't need a degree to dictate that. I do, uh, I do suggest is that you have to have an appetite for learning. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just be complacent in that respect where you have things figured out or you think you know everything. It's like, even now, I love this conversation because I'm learning a lot of stuff that you're talking about. Um, even at my level, like I still act as like the intern that I was 13 years ago or like the first person because I know that there's so many things to learn. Like today, like clips from Spotify, right? Yeah. I could be like, you know, I know every, I know as much as I, I need to. I'm like, no, nah, this is exciting. <laughs> you know, this is the change in the landscape. And I think because music is so, um, is always changing, you got to just be on it when it comes to learning. Um, a couple more that are standing out to me as really, really good questions. Um, as a brand new artist who's starting out from really small, what do you think is more important nowadays in terms of building community, playing live shows or making content and posting it online? And obviously both are important, but which one would you say is weighted higher nowadays? I think it just depends on the circumstance, right? So if you're an artist that has no touring or um, I'd say live music history, I think rely on the content first um, to really help kind of build a fan base. And then that's where you can start to like build your, your touring programming. Um, or in your case, let's say you are a live musician or let's say a session artist or like an artist that performs, especially like in Nashville where you're doing shows every week. Um, you know, I think there's that's an opportunity where you're kind of like, okay, I do this every week just to help, you know, supplement my income. But how do I now couple that with the audience that I'm like building and actually create content for my live performances, repurpose that content to help kind of foster this community that I'm building. So it just really depends on like where you're at as an artist, um, because, you know, you can do both at a point where, you know, you, you have both things running. Right. But I think in the beginning, it's kind of assessing like, where do I have the biggest strengths. If it's content, let me double down here. If it's the live music part, let me double down here. And then you just complement that with the content part or the live music part, you know, just, you know, situ situationally. Yeah, it's super important to know what your goals are because I, I've kind of done mm. both and I've seen huge benefits from both. And my prioritizing them has definitely changed as my career has evolved. Um, on the note of, you know, showing up online and creating that online community, we have one question that is, how important do you believe personal branding is in, in this role? Is it a must now in 2023? I know personal brand is sort of a vague concept in and of itself, but what's your take? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is like, what level of you do you want to put out there, right? Um, I think the biggest thing is that for me, um, I think personal branding is important in order to navigate and kind of build your own personalities. And I think, um, you know, when when people are like, oh, you know, you're Drew from the Digilog or with NPR, I was like, first, I'm, I'm Drew first. Um, I just so happen to work in music. <laughs> I do these things and I love it, but I'm, I'm Drew the person first. And I always try to like showcase that, um, you know, through my content, but, you know, music is obviously a big part of it. 
Um, that's why I do all this inspirational stuff because like, it's not just about the music part anymore. It's about how do I like support, empower people. Um, and I think um, part of that too is also protecting your privacy, right? You know, you don't have to share everything that you do. And I think there has to be something for you. And I think in this day and age where sharing is the, the, the common thing that we do is being able to like, all right, what are the things that are important to me that for my family or like my loved ones that's like personal? And then there's other things that I could share for my fans and for this community that I'm building. Beautiful. Yeah, I think that's key. I think that the the era of oversharing is here and understanding like how that's going to impact you mentally and what your limitations are is really important in ensuring you can sustain yourself long term on social media versus going really, really hard and exposing everything and then having that sort of like vulnerability hangover or maybe like a really high sensitivity to the way you put yourself out there. Um, big respectful of everyone's time. Let's do maybe two more and then anything that we don't get to potentially we can send out like a follow up email with just like some more answers to these burning questions. Um, there's two that are standing out to me. Number one is uh, what do you see in the future for audio Mac and what do you think makes it unique compared to SoundCloud? Yeah, um, we're big fans of audio Mac. I think one, um, they are very artist friendly. And I think the biggest thing what we've seen, not just from a platform standpoint, but more so the people that work there is that they're reachable, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And I think it's so weird to say that, but like when you, when you think about other DSPs, like it, it's so like, it's like a giant wall. Like you don't know who works there, you know, it's just like a big platform where audio Mac, like I know the people, the artists know the people. And I think that's the biggest thing when you're building a platform is that you're not just like creating a, a tool for the artist or the creator you actually there's like there's people here that you actually can acknowledge there's people here that you can connect with and i think you humanize the whole connection when you do that you're not like oh my music is just on audio man. um i think one of the things from a platform standpoint that i love is that they really support independent artists when you look at the majority of their playlists and they're in the, the way that they um feature artists they're all emerging so that's what i love and it's not necessarily driven from like you know other dsks where like it's it's populated by you know major labels or, or these bigger distributors um and i think it evens the playing field because it's less about the the relationship of the label and distributor it's more really about the talent of the mm -hmm. artist right the music there's a real discovery um and not to say soundcloud doesn't have that but i think just from my own experiences working with audio Mac, and that's the reason why we have a playlist there um you know, it's easy just to put, uh, you know, music up versus trying to figure out, you know, um, how to reach out to people from, you know, other DSPs. Yeah, some of the DSPs are a big mystery too. Like Apple Music compared to Spotify with it, you know, not having the, the, the pitch portal like Spotify for Artists does and even Amazon, right? It can be a little harder to figure mm -hmm. out how to get your stuff placed. So I think that's really cool to know that there's maybe more opportunity now and it's maybe less monopolized than labels are by labels than the current platforms that we have, although we do love um, Spotify and Apple and all of those. Um, the, yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh, I just want to add one more thing. And I also love the comment feature. So as as fans or just people that are listening to music on Audio Mac, you can comment on it. Oh my God. Like, you know, yeah. You know, it's not just like SoundCloud where like, you know, you just put a comment on a song. Like there's like, you can put yeah. comments um, across all the songs, right? So yeah which I love. Oh, that's really cool. I did not know that. I did not know that. That's amazing. Um, we have <laughs> 10 more questions. I'm going to pick the one that I think is going to help most people. Oh, there's more questions? And then, yeah, they keep they keep flowing in. Um, but we'll, we'll do one more. And then anything that we don't answer live on the call, we can do a recap email and just like, pop <laughs> up uh, over, over email. But um, the one that stands out to me that I think will help the most people today is when it comes to showing up online and building your community, do you think that artists should have separate social media pages to promote their music and then to share their personal interests and like who they are as a human being? Or do you think they should keep all of that stuff in one place? Like what is the importance of niching down as opposed to just making social media an extension of you? Yeah, this is, um, it's not a cookie cutter answer, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's really based off your, I like to say, um, capacity to want to share like there's some artists that are more about 
hey, I'm, I'm an open book. So I want to share my entire lifestyle. And that works for them, right? So there might be an artist that's like, all right, these are the three things I want to share. I want to share wellness. I want to share my obsession with Pokemon cards. And I want to share my obsession with movies. And that's it. You're not going to know everything else. <laughs> so yeah. I like to say is like, I think as far as creating content and sharing is like create what you feel like you want to share and what communities you want to build and as far as interests, but you don't have to like share everything. I think you, you got to do what, what's best for you. Um, challenge yourself because you can't necessarily just be promotional, like, Hey, check out my song all the time. Right. Yeah. Um, it has to be a mix of things. And then you also have to engage with your community. But I think, like I said, there's no cookie cutter answer. Every artist is very different, but find, what works best for you. And if, once you find that, like to say your stride, your pocket, then stick to it, like, and be consistent with it. You know, if you want to add a few things here and there, do it, but don't go out of scope of what you're doing. Because once you start to do that, then it's like, I don't have time to do anything else. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's definitely a limit to like share, share enough, but don't go so crazy that you you're no longer taking time to make music or whatever. And I, I think like, I'm always going to be a fan of, you know, share, every part of you because you never know or every part that you feel comfortable sharing because you never know what's going to resonate with people right mm -hmm. when i first got on TikTok, i was only sharing my music and it wasn't quite sticking with people the way that i wanted it to and so i was like you know what i'm just gonna go on TikTok and talk about some things that i care about and those talking videos got me my first fans and then you know i started live streaming once i hit a thousand followers and maybe those initial followers didn't follow me for the music right away but i won them over as they got to know me and when you look at you know celebrities that we know and love like throwing out you know Billie Eilish Justin Bieber for example like these people that are huge there are millions and millions and millions of people who feel like they know them because you know they've shared so much about themselves outside of just the music I think it's really hard to connect with people online when everything they post seems like an ad for their product that they're selling or their music right. or whatever so right. it definitely like a, a balance and don't undersell the value of like your interests and, and your perspective mm -hmm. on things like that might win people over even um with my label, like when they first found me, they discovered me because of me talking about the music business. And they were like, you know, we don't even know what your music sounds like, but we're just curious to get to know you better. And then luckily right. later they liked the music and we were, we ended up partnering, but that would have never happened if I was just sharing the music and I didn't open myself up. So I think that's like a really great take is everyone kind of assess what you're comfortable with and then do your best to deliver that and make sure that whatever that answer is, you can be consistent and do it over and over again. And it's not going to drain you or take away too much from your music. Yeah, um, this has been amazing. You guys, there's so many questions. We'll definitely have to do a follow up. But um, before we let everybody go, Drew, any final words you want to share about community or Digilog or anything that you want people to take away? Yeah, I just want to um, give you your flowers for a great interview and moderation. So drop a one if you enjoyed uh, Tiana and her her um, moderation for this uh, session, which has been incredible. Great questions. Um, I think first and foremost, thank you to Thomas and Tan and the whole Indie Flow family for, for giving me the platform to speak and, and share the conversation with you. Um, I think one, if you're going to South by Southwest, uh, we're programming next week, uh, March 14th. Uh, we're gonna do a kickoff party so uh definitely tap in if you're able to attend um and yeah make sure you you support and follow indie flow check out all the things that they have to offer also the digilog like i said we're just you know growing this community uh like i said we're real people behind it um and we hope to see you part of the community uh wherever you are uh hopefully we can see you in person and yeah just happy to be here uh, i love music uh, i love people uh, that um, we're able to help every day and uh, just grateful to, to be part of these conversations. Beautiful. Well, uh, go ahead and drop your at um, for Instagram in the chat too so people can go follow you and keep up with your uh, yeah. day to day. Um, yeah. thank, you, thank you guys all for coming. Definitely make sure that you give Drew a follow. Make sure that you check out Indie Flow. If you haven't yet, you feel like it's a fit for you. Um, I'm an active member of the Indie Flow community, both on Indie Flow and on the Discord. So if you want to get to know me better um, or get some more advice, definitely hop in the Discord. That's the best place to do it. Um, I'll drop my at in the chat as well if you just want to keep up um, with everything. And 
Um, thank you guys for, for your questions and your participation. I think that your questions at the end especially really drove a lot of value and, and gave you an opportunity to speak on some things that um, were super important for the community. So thanks everyone for their time. Thank you, Drew, for your time and for staying a little bit over to make sure that we get to everyone. And stay tuned, everyone, for a follow-up email um, with some more answers to your burning questions. And for the person in the chat who asked, yes, there will be a replay. So the session was recorded. Um, you'll probably see snippets of it on social media as well. So stay tuned. And with that, Drew, it was amazing having you. Thank you, everyone, Thank for you. your time. And we will wrap Thank it you, there. Thank you, everyone. Have thanks, a wonderful everyone. night, guys. Have a good night. Talk soon. Bye. Cheers.